our philosophy is that if we're creating or setting up the right parameters and we're creating a place where people like to work and they're, you know, financially doing well, what reason would they want to leave? Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week, I am speaking with founder and CEO of Indigo River, Dana Prastis who is the first waterfront architect. Uh, She is trailblazing a new category in the industry. Indigo River, the name of her company, is a woman-owned transdisciplinary design firm focused on progressive waterfront architecture, resiliency, and climate adaptation. They are a leading authority in New York Harbor and beyond, and the firm specializes in climate adaptation through waterfront solutions that are very rigorous in the way that they integrate, transcend boundaries, and guide and execute projects from the initial concepts right the way through to the final construction and operations. Uh, Dana herself is a waterfront architect, a civil engineer, a futurist, a climate adaption expert, an entrepreneur, a creative visionary, and she's driven to transform the built world at the water's edge. She creates and utilizes a transdisciplinary and progressive mindset, and she's fueled by the overlapping of design, technology, and nature. She is a licensed architect with a graduate degree in civil engineering. She was born and raised in Anchorage in Alaska and deeply appreciates nature and humankind's ability to design, build, and create infrastructure in some of the world's harshest conditions. She's an experienced leader. Um, She's led a number of innovative projects around the world, directing infrastructure construction, marine engineering, and the design of waterfront architecture. This experience has given her the tools to navigate the firm's diverse clients' work, and with her unique vision and competency in construction engineering and waterfront architecture, they are creating some really exciting projects. Um, Before starting Indigo River, Dana worked at DCAK MSA Architecture and Engineering as the Director of Project Management and Business Development. She worked at the McLaren Engineering Group as a Senior Project Manager and the Conti Group. She earned her Bachelor of Architecture at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, where she subsequently completed a graduate degree in civil engineering. Um, So a pretty impressive CV resume, if you like, here. She also went to Harvard Business School's uh, leading professional service firm's uh, executive education program. And this really laid the foundation for a fascinating conversation where we discussed in the practice um, what is intrapreneurialism and what does that mean for Dana and how are they cultivating it in and at Indigo River and why it's so important. We talked about why defining a niche and this new category of architecture has been so important and successful for the firm. And we also look at how some of the company's multiple service offerings, because they've got this disciplinary um, culture and, and they're working with different types of engineers and designers, they're able to offer an array of different service offerings, which in a way actually act as a kind of paid for marketing, a kind of series of consulting services, which then lead into much more involved and developed work. So this was a really fascinating conversation, loads of gold in it. So sit back, relax and enjoy. Dana Prastis. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Dana, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm doing well, and thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. Now, you have got quite a fascinating CV. You've studied at the Harvard Business School. You are a waterfront alchemist. Um, You're a transdisciplinary designer. You're the founder of Indigo River. 
um you've studied civil engineering and architecture as well so there's a, there's quite a broad eclectic mix of construction based endeavors that you've got expertise in um and i've been quite interested in your work and the kind of stuff that you're doing in in around the hudson's uh bay area and in, in new york uh and it's a real delight to have you on the show so welcome thank you First question then is, how would you best describe Indigo River? So Indigo River was formed to be a multidisciplinary firm, and we do focus on anything and everything related to waterfront and shoreline. So I have a more traditional architecture background, my undergrad degree. Um, I had also received a master's in civil engineering and other members of our team include traditional architects, naval mm -hmm. architects, marine engineers, environmental engineers, coastal engineers, um, waterfront planners. So we do have quite an array of specialists, but all focused on and dedicated to working at the water's edge. Why the water's edge? Why, what was it that kind of compelled you to create a, a niche specialism, if you like, on this so particular I, location or condition? Sure, I didn't 12 years ago or 15 years ago, kind of when I entered the field, I wasn't necessarily looking to be a waterfront architect. I don't think um, I would have acknowledged that that could exist as a specialty, uh, mm -hmm. but I had finished my master's and it was right around the 2008-9 uh, kind of economic recession. And I was looking to go into a field where I wasn't going to be necessarily a, a CAD jockey at kind of the bottom of the barrel for an architecture firm. And so I, I went into a construction company, a self-performing contractor who just coincidence was working on the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. And so that was kind of my first foray into waterfront uh, infrastructure. And yeah. from there, the specialties and the expertise learned from that point, I continued to lean into it. And my next firm that I worked on was uh, I entered a marine department and worked on marine projects, a lot of ferry landings and coastal infrastructure. So bulkheads, wharfs, keys, marinas, ports, um, and, and started to really see that there's opportunity for architects as well, not just engineers in these spaces, um, and to lean into it as a specialty. And the more I did that, and the more also uh, kind of the specialty or the the focus on not only sustainable planning but resilient planning and climate adaptation um, this is a space where you have nature working every day forces acting against structures every day and it's mm -hmm. um, maybe more prevalent than other traditional upland landlock sites uh, where you're really working with nature and considering the forces and over a longer period and so uh, marrying my my background of having grown up in Alaska in the wilderness and nature um, and having a real appreciation for nature and now being in a you know concrete jungle uh, makes sense now looking back that I, I focused in and leaned into this you know waterfront area that really is mm. anywhere there's water there is nature um, so I didn't necessarily look to do it but as I started getting experience I, I saw the opportunity and looked to surround myself with like-minded individuals who also appreciate nature as well as human ability mm -hmm. to design in some of these tough, constrained conditions. What kind of market advantage or opportunities have you noticed by this, by kind of focusing in on this type of topographical niche, if you like? Sure. So yeah, it is I, um, a topographical niche. It's really its own design typology. We were always working at an edge condition and it's, you know, whether or not it's a, a bold line of a, you know, bulkhead vertical structure or if it's kind of a, a grade zone of littoral region where the the tidal range varies yeah so the um the market opportunity certainly opens the doors for expertise in waterfront and it's not only the technical constraints but there's a lot of um, constructability areas for expertise as well as logistics and sequencing so uh not only do we, you know, bring materials to site by a truck on roads, but oftentimes we're actually bringing materials and equipment to site by water. Um, so there's areas for additional expertise and to leverage those expertise mm. in the design process as well. So some ways that that can be done. Um, I, I went to school at NGIT and I remember a design problem where we had a, a structure to build and we had to kind of design the maximum beam length to be brought in by truck on city roads. And that's really neal very real a uh, constraint that architects yeah. and design professionals faces, you know, what's the largest segment that can be brought in 
realistically what is feasible. And so when you work on the waterfront, some of those constraints release. There are certainly other sets of constraints that are layered on, but uh, there's maybe even more opportunity for creativity within that logistical and sequencing and constructability aspects of the design. And so um, part, again, of my background was construction and being in the field on design build, being on the contractor side and kind of looking at what was on the paper and thinking, you know, how will this actually get built? And so mm -hmm. that now on the design side is always kind of embedded in my mind, as well as the mind of individuals on our team. It's quite interesting, actually, to to build a business around a like kind of locational or like a kind of uh, like a, a geographic, not as geographic, but top topographical kind of set of conditions. We don't see it very often in architecture, surprisingly. Um, we'll often see, you know, niches developing in sectors or niches developing in housing typologies. Occasionally, I might come across like coastal architects or hillside architects. Um, or, or, or kind of what you're talking about here, waterfront ar uh, architecture and engineering. Why do we not see it very often, do you think? And and what have been, you know, some of the advantages that you've found? So it, it's a maybe a criticism of mine at large is kind of within the architecture profession of, of why there aren't more specialists and more specialties mm -hmm. that are um, offered even early early on in the design education process, certainly by industry or, you know, medical or uh, landscape architecture, they're different from design thinking. They kind of all boil up, boil down to different types of architecture and different types of professions. And I think uh, looking historically at what an architect was, uh, you know, had under their purview to offer as far as services, we kept the generalist role, but we lost a lot of that specialty uh, right. kind of along the way. And so even when you look at design they'll call themselves design professionals, but they may not be licensed or, um, you know, educated in, in, in such a way that they have the design expertise, uh, but they'll often get, you know, an accreditation in, in sustainability or resiliency and then kind of sell their services and those specialties. And really those are all pieces of what architecture is. Um, not that there isn't value in those certification programs. There absolutely is, but it's uh, kind of a lost opportunity, I think, for architecture um, and the, prof the professionals within the space to differentiate themselves and not just be this generalist, but mm. to really go deeper into a vertical of certainly whether it's industry or geographical typology, uh, but different conditions where there there is something positive to be gained from focusing exclusively on that and then tying it back to the bigger picture. And that's what architects do really well is not necessarily always having the depth of knowledge in every vertical, but the more that we can focus in a few verticals and then tie it back and connect it to the bigger picture, um, the, the greater value that we're adding back into the built environment. So, so what kind of clients do you typically work with? Are, are you working with a lot of kind of developers who are primarily focusing on in on the waterfront or is it actually quite a, a wide array of different people who are building along and there can't be that much more waterfront left in New York, is there? Or uh, There's 520 miles of, of uh, coastline oh, in New York go. City. <laughs> um, and that's just New York City. That's not including certainly on the other side of the Sound in Connecticut or on the other side of the Hudson in New Jersey. Um, but there's plenty of, of waterfront. And the types of clients that we have is a, a range of sometimes it's um, agencies and municipalities. Uh, sometimes it's private developers, sometimes it's private homeowners, just depends on the, the type and scale of the project. And that's something I really enjoy about focusing in on this one condition of, you know, water meets man-made uh, is the, the cross-section of clients that we have and the cross-section yeah. of projects and the types of projects that we have. Um, so while we might not, you know, have traditional, whether residential or commercial architecture, uh, anytime those programs are located on a waterfront site, we're involved and it's not always to be engineer architect of record. Sometimes it's in capacity as an owner's representative because they haven't worked on the waterfront before. They don't know the constraints. Certainly there are uh, many different regulatory constraints that are layered on and it's uh, in New York Harbor, especially largely one of the most heavily regulated zones that you can work within is on the waterfront because you're not right. only dealing with you know zoning and traditional upland conditions, you're also dealing with different environmental uh, bodies for you know the environment as well as navigation and so there are different levels and layers of agency coordination that's required which in and of itself just in terms of expediting becomes a, a subspecialty of being able to navigate those challenges 
Wow. So how do how do you typically find your your clients? And are there kinds of like other um, like sort of trade journals or other specialism, other other disciplines that are specialising in on the waterfront that kind of actually make quite a useful group where you can all be pitching and creating thought leadership in the same domain? Sure. So it ranges. Sometimes it's often enough by referral, just having navigated, you know, a, a challenging environment for, for one client and then having their neighbor, you know, a couple blocks down asking, you know, who did you use or I've run into challenges and, and how can we um, kind of sort this out and get through it. Uh, oftentimes for public works, it's a public procurement process for an RFP or an RFQ. Um, in terms of other consultants that we work with, we're not always, you know, the prime architect or, or engineer, we're a sub consultant to a larger team. Uh, and we work traditionally with, you know, even, you know, the big box engineering and architecture firms that maybe don't have their own specialists in this space. Um, we also work with many landscape architecture firms, as well as ecologists. Um, so really, there are, there are many different types of specialists that work in this zone. Um, and we find ourselves, you know, repeating to work with many of the same teaming partners uh, time and again. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about the structure of your own company? Then, who's who's involved? I know that it's uh, um, there's there's a lot of different types of expertise inside of the business. How is how is the business structured? You've got a business partner as as well. There's two of yes, you, so, Dom, Dominica. Uh, a couple of partners actually. So, Dominica Stasiak is a marine engineer who joined us um, a couple of years ago uh, in the midst of the pandemic, and prior to that, uh, my first partner and is Shay Thorvaldson, who I met at McLaren, uh, a firm that I worked at previously. Um, and uh, aside from the kind of principal level, we've recruited different individuals who have worked, some have worked with us in the past successfully, some have, you know, answered job postings, depending on what the, what the role is, the latest role that I think we've hired is something called the climate adaptation specialist, which if you would have told me that was a role 10 years ago, I would have said, what is that? <laughs> um, but as we're kind of evolving our, and our work scope evolves beyond, you know, traditional um, waterfront infrastructure, it's also expanded into a lot of resiliency consulting and climate adaptation planning. Um, and so some of those more scientific ex expertise are uh, useful in, in projecting, you know, we, we can look at historically what's happened on a site, but it's also helpful to look at what the forecast would, you know, we think will be happening and what are some of the latest even business cases for um, presenting clients with these different options? And so mm -hmm. flood mitigation planning, just again, because we're comfortable working in, on, and with the water, um, that's something I've identified many of my architect peers to kind of be afraid of, be afraid of the water. But if, if that's all you work with, um, you can't really be afraid of it. You figure out how to work with it. Um, so that's certainly an area that's expanded. But in terms of the larger structure, I mentioned um, we, we also have naval architects. So much of what we do while we work on the land side, there's also often, you know, floating aspects. So what does that floating architecture look like, even if it's, you know, a dock or a landing? Mm. Um, and, and what does that interface and range of motion look like? And what is that like to be experienced? So I, I never learned how to design anything to float in traditional architecture school, but we have two uh, naval architects who are on our team, as well as a professional engineer, marine diver. So to know, you know, what's going on below the surface, quite literally to dive down and understand what the condition of, you know, a past piece of infrastructure is or what needs to happen to bring it up to up to date. Well, it sounds actually almost a little bit frightening to consider that you might hire an architect or an engineer who doesn't have this expertise. So if, you're, it's, if, if you're working it's in those not, kinds it's, of it's actually, I find well, many of the people that we've, I mean, if whether or not they have a a work history in the space and work experience in the space, I think you ask any member of our team kind of why they like to work on the waterfront, and it's it's a true passion. It's an area that everyone enjoys interacting mm -hmm. with, even in their you know time away from work is is being on the water. And I will say, going to site visits, I mean, it's not always the most glamorous, but if you're on the water, it's it can't be that bad a day. <laughs> so we certainly enjoy it. Great, great, and 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 in terms of um, the sorts of projects that you've got on at the moment who what kinds of things are you working on that are incredibly exciting 
So mix of mix of different types of projects, some municipal and some are, you know, rehabilitating vertical infrastructure that has been in place for decades um, and, and that requires a, an understanding of kind of the history of different types of construction along the waterfront and different types of equipment that was available, you know, 50 plus years ago, as opposed to some of our newer, newer technologies. Um, when it's a developer that's doing a new build, those are, you know, often very exciting types of projects, especially when they want to engage with the water mm -hmm. um, or create access, recreational access to the water. Uh, we work a lot with park agencies along the waterfront. So anyone who has either a lake or a coastline that is a whether state or federal park, um, looking at those types of projects. And I'm trying to think what other, like I said, we do have quite a few flood mitigation pro projects. So, um, lately as we observe the climate to have additional impacts on built infrastructure mm. it's um, become a a niche specialty to be able to focus in on all right it's what's, building is experiencing flooding how can we mitigate that i suppose what's really interesting for me is that you've got these different tiers or these different kinds of service offerings which go well beyond your traditional architectural design services and there's this nice healthy amount of consulting services which is great because these are the sorts of services if you're doing mitigation uh, flood mitigation studies um, for a client before they've even thought about building something or perhaps they're looking at existing physical assets on the waterfront that's that's such a good way to start developing a relationship with somebody through these other these other kind of little these little discrete packages of of study work which a lot of architecture practices don't have the ability to do yeah no that's that's absolutely right and one of the more exciting spaces that i like to kind of work and play in is early stage development and that can be that can come in the form of um you know due diligence for site selection or um understanding different programming and kind of outlining different programming for a given site. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's the traditional architecture contract here in the United States is a client comes to you with a, a site, a survey and a program. And then you kind of, as an architect, get started there. But in those two pieces that are brought, if, if an architect can help advise on, well, you want this program, it doesn't quite go with this site. Let's look for another site that fits it better. Or you want this site, but this program isn't quite ideal. Let's figure out how we can repackage it. Um, those are some of the more interesting conversations to have. And just at a conceptual level, be able to crank out, you know, a couple different iterations of uh, varying degrees of, and varying potentials. Um, super exciting space to work in. And then, of course, sometimes we get involved later in a project where it's it's already started and maybe kind of gone down a rabbit hole in a in a wrong direction and we have to rein it back in to get it mm. to be, you know, feasible or buildable or permittable. Um, so, yeah, different kind so, of alternative so, services that we offer. So there's, there's a kind of... Um a kind of creative aspect where you're being much more propositional in terms of what you're suggesting or the services that you're offering there's one which is more to do with the oversight of what's happening in construction a more analytical advisory one and then this one where you're kind of consulting in the sense of um, you know doing whatever studies are needed to understand what the constraints are so there's some yeah no that, that's absolutely right and sometimes um, as I mentioned, it's a heavily regulated space. So sometimes our, mm. one of our first kind of rapid fire exercises is to do an alternatives analysis of, all right, well, this is what's been proposed by the project design team to date. Um, let's just see is, are there other ways that we can use the same components or other ways that we can package it that have a, a lesser environmental impact or navigational impact? Uh, and so kind of peeling back and considering alternative approaches is, uh, where we enjoy spending our time. So have you considered development yourself and, and is that part and parcel of some, a service offering or part of the future? Is that Always really considering ahead? developing ourselves. <laughs> um, we know a lot of the sites kind of inside out, upside down and backwards. And so we keep yeah. our eye on them when they come available and, and certainly look for opportunities um, to develop or to partner on a development. Because it, it, yeah, it does. It does seem like this is actually quite a it, it's such a sort of niche and interesting body of specialism that you could make it pay a lot of dividends by doing your own developments. I'm sure, obviously, land in New York is you know not easy to come by, and it's a very aggressive real estate um, market. Um, so, so how how big is the company then? How many of there are you? I'm, we have I'm, fifteen people. 15 people and and how do you kind of internally organize it what does it look like 
in so terms of teams or so. two primary partners and a chief of staff. We also, so in addition to Indigo River, we have another client facing company, TMS Waterfront. And um, within New York and within much of the United States, there are uh, often government incentives for women owned or minority owned or service disabled veteran owned businesses. Mm-hmm. And so uh, my partner and I each have different classifications. So we set up, you know, two different companies and for all intents and purposes, we, we treat them like different departments, but the, the staff that we have, um, you know, some are self-directed, self-led, they, they know what they're doing. Others are more junior where they require a little bit of kind of handholding, mentoring, mm. you know, leadership showing, um, kind of to, to grow them and strengthen them. And much of what we do really to center around our people, their expertise, their background and their aspirations of, you know, where they want to grow, what their potential is. And so we're not always, you know, hiring because someone knows how to do something, but Mm -hmm. because they have the, the different building blocks that we're confident we can get them to do that. And it aligns, there's a, a very genuine and authentic alignment with what they want to do, which is a big part of it. Not trying to, you know, force anyone into an area of their career that they're not looking to, to deepen. How how has your role evolved um, since the kind of inception of the business where I'm, I'm assuming it was you you and Dominica who kind of founded it together or was it just you started by yourself? Uh, so Shay and I started um, and Shane. Dominica joined a couple of years after we formed. Um, I, I think early on, just our by function of the, the first couple of contracts that we got, we, we did set up very thoughtfully to be on a retainer base, which mm-hmm. isn't typical for the architecture profession. Um, but we were able to set them up in such a way that we weren't, that we knew our costs were covered. Um, and so we could focus on certainly getting more work and, um, business development as well as, you know, some other areas. But the, the initial role that I played was really setting up the companies and setting them up, um, the different processes and procedures and systems that we have in place. Um, and I've, you know, been able since to, um, you know, hire and train a chief of staff to do much of that and, uh, you know, even selecting and setting up our, our invoicing and accounting system and kind of the, the less glamorous side of business, but a necessary evil. Um, so certainly not what I learned in architecture school um, mm-hmm. and not what I learned in much of my, uh, you know, technical architecture and engineering experience, but a, you know, just practical necessity. Um, and so that was, you know, much of the first year or two of the business was getting that kind of up and running to not run by itself, but to be um, organized and jump in when I needed, but otherwise step back. And then the pandemic hit in year three, which was a whole other pivot point of, um, you know, working remote and what that meant for productivity. And we were uh, fortunate in that we had set up to start to be fully remote if and when we needed. And that's just by function of, you know, having different people working on different sites at different time. And so everything was already cloud-based and everyone already had laptops. So that wasn't a necessarily a challenge, but resetting our our, our meeting schedule so that we weren't, you know, pounding everyone with meetings back to back, but kind of being strategic and thoughtful and deliberate with what Mm -hmm. meetings we had and making sure that, um, we were able to stay productive and stay healthy and, um, physical and mental wellness, just kind of a core focus of ours. And it's not within, uh, much of the, the industry kind of at large. And that was one of my core reasons for founding Indigo River was to, form something that I couldn't find. Um, mm-hmm. And that's not to say that there aren't great firms out there. There are, but just by function of kind of where I live and the the lifestyle I wanted, I, I couldn't find um, that perfect alignment or match. And so I set out to create it and um, have since attracted others who appreciate that kind of balance as well. Well, let's talk a little bit about that, about the, some of the unique cultural aspects of Indigo River. Um, what What's, and this is also really interesting in terms of, you know, a, when we step into a leadership position and the importance of creating culture and a space where people can thrive. And this is a real sort of hot topic at the moment in the architecture industry where lots of old methods of, of working are coming under scrutiny and it's becoming revealed, you know, so many people, so many practices are paying below whatever the local living wages or, you know, livable wages and, you know, working crazy long hours. And it does beg the question, well, this is a huge investment to become trained and qualified as an architect. And then you're going into a, into a profession and a job where it's difficult to sustain a livable wage. Why bother? Um, so, so what are the sorts of things that you've been doing to like combat that in your own, in your own business? Sure. So, I mean, part of it comes down to people and just respecting people at any level and that respecting Mm -hmm. that work is work and people have a life outside of work. 
Um, and that's more respect than I think I received in much of my prior experience was that, you know, you can have commitments outside of work and maintain them without having work kind of bleed into all areas of your life and drain you. Um, mm. So again, having experienced that, wanted to really uh, amplify that concern of, we don't typically work past five or six, which is almost unheard of for an architecture firm. Um, granted, we start early, but we, again, we're thoughtful, we're deliberate, we're methodical with with our work and with our workflow. And we're not, um, certainly we're ambitious, but we're not biting off more than we can chew. We're realistic about what it takes to get a job done. Um, and we trust our employees. So we're not micromanaging and looking over people's shoulders. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not, you know, having, I've heard of stories of people in the pandemic having cameras locked on for their employers to spy on them. And that to me just seemed like a crazy invasive, you know, just deeply creepy. <laughs> yeah. I just couldn't, couldn't even imagine, uh, just beyond the, you know, lack of trust or, or respect or, um, whatever's going on to, to warrant that if, if that's a necessary level, I would rather not have any of it. Um, yeah. so that's, um, one part is just kind of respecting work-life balance and that people have commitments outside of work and that they want to, you know, be recharged and have energy outside of work and not be working every weekend and late every night. Um, and another part of that is just health benefits. We pay full benefits for our employees. We don't require a match or a percent match. Um, we want everyone to, uh, be compensated well so that they're not worrying about money. If they're worrying about money, they're not focusing on work. Um, so there are just some very, to me, practical approach approaches mm. that we utilize of, um, you know, with empathy, again, things that maybe we didn't experience or would have liked to experience and couldn't find. And so we created, and as far as a business model, um, you know, we've been profitable, we've been successful and much of our profit and success is attributed to our team members. It's not all one person or two people. It's, it's the team and it's keeping people happy so that they can focus on work and get satisfaction out of their work and not, um, maybe every day, every task isn't enjoyable, but by and large, we, we have, uh, employee reviews and employee development work plans that we want to know where people want to grow, what direction and help them get there. So if we find out one person, we had an individual early on say she wanted to become wetland delineated or delineator certified. And so we said, okay, well, let's find the course. Let's invest in that. Let's get you there. Mm. Um, and that's just something that if, if someone has a desire, especially if it's something to do with education, we will always support and encourage that and, you know, pick up the the financial end of, of what it's, is required because at the end, it's not an expense, it's an investment in our employees and that's an investment in our company. And so that's just kind of a mentality that we exercise. And again, maybe it's because of the the empathy of, of not having experienced it always or feeling like it would have been helpful to have that um, and not having had it. So we offer it. You've got some experience in terms of uh, business education and training, which again is something unusual in both engineering and the business uh, and architecture um, space. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what your what kind of training you've done, what sorts of work you did, and why why you felt that was a, an important thing to do? Sure. So I, I just part of I think who makes or what makes me who I am is. Um, a keen awareness to any shortcomings or any challenging right. areas. And so things that don't come naturally um, are, are things that I haven't had exposure to. And so certainly I was educated in, in architecture and in, in civil engineering. So I had a lot of technical expertise and I've, you know, been on different construction sites. And so, you know, the, the people side of working with people has, has evolved, but I'd never had any formal um, education within business um, and, and identification of programs that could help expedite that. So early on when we formed Indigo River, I did, I attended Harvard Business, Harvard Business School's um, leading professional service firm uh, coursework and met peers that were in, in similar scenarios that, you mm. know, they had a technical expertise, a lot of engineers, a lot of architects, a lot of doctors, different uh, accountants, different professional service firms that similarly had the technical education, but never had the practical business education. And so that was a uh, really great program and help to emphasize what choices we have within business. And it's not um, kind of take it or leave it as it comes, but you could be thoughtful in who you hire, who you work with as a client, who you don't work with as a client. Um, and so some just kind of basic principles that um, I don't know without that perspective, exactly what types of projects or what types of people um, we'd be working with. So just kind of helped reinforce some of the core uh, beliefs to how we operate. 
That's, that's also very interesting that you're doing it alongside other professionals to kind of see the constraints that they're dealing with as well. And I've often found it very interesting talking to doctors who actually experience a lot of the same business problems that architects do because mm-hmm. they were never trained. They were just focalized on the specialism. Um, and it's, 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 it's quite interesting. Um, when, when you were kind of start, how long was that program? Uh, a couple of weeks. It was a couple of weeks remote. And then uh, I think uh, a week or two weeks in person, uh, intensive. So like eight got hours it, a day. Right. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So, so it was, it was a kind of, you know, um, an intensive program for a, for a few weeks. Um, what then in terms of your own like, uh, leadership and, and structures and, and kind of cultivation of the business, what have been some of the most innovations that you've been doing more recently? So one of the things that helps me, I think the most to innovate is to get perspective. So not always just head down in the technical world um, and the technical work, but to volunteer or mentor or kind of get outside of the day-to-day. And so I I do volunteer with NCARB, which is the architecture registration board that helps with the licensing process in in the United States. Um, I volunteer with AIA on an adaptation and advisory uh, committee. And so sometimes in those well, technically focused work groups, you form relationships that kind of extend and um, extend out of the traditional day to day. And some of those mm-hmm. relationships are super valuable, even bringing it back to work in terms of teaming and partnership and um, learning what others are doing within the space. Because that's one thing where, uh, similarly, if you're if you're in a small firm, you don't get the exposure of what's going on in whether in other small firms or in larger firms. Um, you can kind of feel like you're um, falling behind or missing something. And so gaining that perspective and attending some of the conferences or talking on different panels with other professionals in the same space um, can be super enlightening and again, bring it back to to work and even just some of the tools that are used or some of the materials that are selected and seeing how others are working in the space and relating it back to what we do. Mm. In terms of the kind of uh, management of people inside of the business, how what sorts of things have you implemented over the last few years in terms of just kind of keeping profits in check and keeping monitors on 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 money on cash flow and what does what does the inner workings look like inside of the business that um, you know again because the reason I bring this up is just notoriously engineers architects might not always have their eyes on profit for example. I know it sounds kind of crazy sometimes when I talk to CPAs about uh, some of the things that we that we deal with. Um, but I, I do fully appreciate that many architects, for example, they're not they're not in it for profit. That wasn't that wasn't the intention to begin with. What sorts of things do you have in, in terms of financial checks and balances and and reporting to make sure that the business is always kind of keeping afloat and going after the targets that you want to be making? So we, we do utilize a robust reporting system for certainly for timekeeping often, you know, also for, for invoicing. Um, and we make every project fully available to everyone in the company. So that's something that I remember working kind of in junior positions and wondering, being told, you know, keep this project within budget and thinking, well, what's, what's the project budget? I don't have access to <laughs> see that it. Mean, like, <laughs> but yeah, I just didn't check out. And so I remember many times, you know, wanting to do the right thing and then not having the permissions or the access or the clearance level uh, to actually have the awareness to do the right thing. And so just kind of oxymoron. And so the our, our response has been just to make everything available. And we, we go over... Um, I mean, in terms of management, we have a, a Monday morning meeting where we go over, you know, any hot or urgent items for coordination. And then throughout the week, we have a one-on-one check-in with everyone on the team. Um, and it's really their meeting to run. But we have kind of the the list up of if they're, you know, if they're working on one main project, what they're working on, or if they're juggling seven or eight projects, kind of what the priorities are. Um, and we have a end of week financial meeting where we look at cash flow. So we understand, you know, what's outstanding, what's 30, 60, 90, 120 days, and who's making the calls on that. Um, We share our aging AR uh, accounts receivable reports with the team, with the project manager, so that they're fully aware, especially if um, we don't like to. (laughs) Yeah, we don't like to give ultimatums. We like to be generally flexible and we like um, oftentimes, I mean, our client repeat rate is high. And that's in large part because we're very thoughtful when we put together proposals that we're not, um, we're not 
inflexible if we, we want to leave the client with what they need. And so if, yeah. if we miss something, if we miss a scope entirely or another scope develops, sure, we'll add services. Um, but we try not to nickel and dime for change orders. We try and, you know, meet client needs and be flexible working with them. Um, and so we, we also try not to harp on 30 day payment and things like that. Just we, we try and focus on the technical work and we let them know that. And when it comes time that, you know, payments way past due and we really need the cash, we'll, we'll let them know. We'll have a direct and transparent conversation with them and with our mm -hmm. team as well. So no one's really in the dark. Everyone is, is pretty up to speed with um, where we stand financially as a company. Um, not at the same kind of weekly basis as our, as our management team, but annually we do a state of the state of the onion, we call it kind of peeling back the layers. Um, and it's our, it's our time that we, not only we do our you know employee reviews um annual reviews and we revisit them on a whether quarterly basis to you know reflect on what goals are being met but we also um share all of our financials of what the goals were um where we met up against them um and so every person in the company knows kind of where we stand financially what our goals are what our targets are how we stacked up um, and that's not something that's kept from anyone. And so mm. not everyone, I think, cares to the same degree, but it's just, again, out of that transparency of, you know, how healthy are we or, or where are we not healthy? Where do we need to focus? Um, what types of projects are most profitable? And again, having a sophisticated reporting system that, um, you know, we log our time and it's very quick and easy to see what our, you know, work in progress on a project is or what have we burned on the project? Um, and so that's those project by project, we'll, we'll bring up that material and the one-on-one -on -one check in sometimes and just say like, we're burning a lot more than we anticipated. What's going on right. or where did we go wrong? And then make sure that that information is translated to the next proposal of a similar project. Um, so learning as we go, we're not perfect. We don't have a crystal ball, but we do act transparently and consistently with our team members and, and letting them know where we stand and giving them access to, to access that information as well. I, I think that's very a very wise and kind of courageous move actually in, in, in many ways for business leaders to be transparent with their numbers um, to their, for their team members. Because every, every time I've seen this done or when I've worked myself in, in businesses where there's been a degree of transparency with what's happening with profit and numbers and project targets that, you know, those who want to take interest, take interest in it. And there's a comfort around it. And there's also a comfort around it. Let's say the business does make a loss that nobody's trying to hide it and it sparks a conversation and that there's actually a platform for everybody to contribute ideas and actually it diffuses any kind of worry or concern um, because the leaders of the business are able to say, you know, we made a, we made a loss in, in Q1, that's okay. We were kind of part ex expecting that. We spent more time in business development. We've got a healthy pipeline of potential projects that are coming in and our projections for the second two quarters are looking very very healthy um you know in what we need from you or how you're you're what you guys are working great how you're you know what you're doing is help, help allowing us to you know maximize the amount of revenue that we can bill for each quarter and it just sort of oh right okay but then there's there are lots of other um businesses that are very very kind of cagey with the numbers and you know i, I guess that's often a, a case of well, not being clear on them yourself in, yeah, in I, I don't know what the what the motive is there, or if it's just kind of that's the way it was done, and so that's the way they know how to do it. Um, mm -hmm. But certainly, that transparency and that level of communication permeates throughout much of our work, not only in terms of financials, but also certainly in terms of marketing opportunities. Of what is our win rate? What is this? What is our multiplier? What is our kind of feeding into what the overhead costs are, in addition to the utilization rates of uh, billability? And so, having these conversations and and bringing up the general awareness of, of where we stand as a company, but also as individuals where every person stands and their ability to look that up and, and, and really comprehend it, their impact on the company, I, I think helps. And it gives some accountability and ownership also that um, similarly when, when things, I mean, having that understanding of not every project is going to be a good project. You're going to have some bad projects. That's just the way the cookie crumbles. That's the way the world is. Um, and similarly, not every decision everyone makes is going to be the right one. People will make wrong decisions and fail. And so we've always communicated that 
we'd rather someone make the decision and have it be the wrong decision than not make a decision and not communicate that we empower, we encourage, we incentivize um, our individuals to grow because sometimes those wrong decisions are what make that lasting impact for the right decision for the rest of your career. And that's a lesson yeah. worth learning. Um, so we cer certainly don't penalize if you want to call, um, you know, errors or, or failing failure, because that's just a learning opportunity. And so mm -hmm. as much as we can, we try to learn from it, communicate it and grow, move on. We yeah. don't dwell on it. You mentioned uh, um, a moment ago as well about change orders, and this is not something that you, you kind of nickel and dime clients for. And it's, and it's interesting because it is one of these areas that um, more so I'm going to guess in the architectural services that can come become really inflated. And my understanding, and, and you know, I'd like to hear how you guys do this, that sometimes with a lot of engineering type bits of work, that it can be more discrete packages of things. Whereas an architectural project will often have a much longer lifespan um, that, that has a lot more emergence, if you like. There's a lot more unknowns. There's a lot more kind of which direction is it going to go in and then hence the chain the, the management of change orders between the two different disciplines can be quite different what, what's your experience with that and how do you how do you manage it in terms of setting fees to make sure that you've got a bit of buffer there so i mean we don't like to and i don't think clients appreciate either being billed on a you know time and material basis because you could you right. know, spin your wheels and go down the wrong hole and the client doesn't want to pay for that um, so we really do look at our proposals as the as a value add, and we try to demonstrate where we are adding that value. Um, and that oftentimes comes in taking smaller bites up front so that we can have a clear scope and program and have the fee be proportional so that we're not, you know, putting a proposal out for the entire project day one. We might outline a few key tasks, due diligence tasks up front mm -hmm. that will help shape the remainder of what needs to be proposed on or, or how we can outline uh, and we also don't try to um, kind of back corners into only working back clients into corners, only working with us. There are certainly we know what our value add is. And in terms of, um, you know, larger scale design, we're not a we're not a production firm. We're not looking to be engineer and architecture of record on everything we work on. We're very happy consulting and advising on our area of expertise. And we play nice in the sandbox. We like to work with other consultants. We're not trying to steal their work. Um, and, and they may have a team that's much more competent and efficient in doing some of that production work. Um, and so we, we try to complement and augment the team in the best way that we know how. And that comes down to a lot of flexibility and, you know, adapting on the fly to a project and its goals. Um, so sometimes, yeah, we do propose smaller scopes up front so that we can get to A, know the client, B, know what the goals of the project are, mm -hmm. and C, understand how we fit into that and not try to, again, bite off more than we can chew or leave a lot on the table. It's it's really striking that balance. And that's not an opportunity you have in, in every project on you know public procurement processes. They'll give you a bid form that you're filling in and they want it apples to apples against every other bidder. So you have to find other ways to demonstrate what your value add is. Um, but certainly on the private side of development, we can uh, take a little bit more liberty and creatively proposing on the opportunity and demonstrate our value um, even in terms of what our what our fee will be yeah and uh, that's that's very intelligent and I, and I guess if you're chunking down bits of work into these kind of discrete packages it kind of it kind of allows you to well we're not going to set the price for the fee for the next stage of work until we've done this bit so we actually know exactly what's yeah what's and, and involved. we'll give sometimes we'll give a range so it's not like we're pulling a number out of thin air but we'll sure. say you know phase one is x phase two is y and phase c is going to be anywhere from you know this to that um mm. just to give them an understand an understanding and also to um outline what some of the factors are do we need to have an eis do we need to go to public um public notice like what wh what is the timeline going to be and so some of these other items that can trigger different technical responses will outline and kind of give a range of what we anticipate um and and of course give disclaimers as to what assumptions we're making around that and that you know sometimes something comes up and it changes and an assumption wasn't right but then you just again that same transparent conversation we're not trying to um you know, take advantage of a client by any means, but we'll justify whatever it is that's different than what our assumption was yeah. and try and move from there. What, what's been some of the most unexpected challenges that you've faced since the, the founding of the company and either ones that you're still battling with or ones that you've overcome? I think one of maybe the most challenging things for me early on was getting out of that 
I mean, certainly setting up some of the systems, but pulling myself out of the day to day um, right. of that and, and really delegating it with a, you know, a follow up checking process in place. Um, but being able to step back a bit and focus more on some of the technical and some of the design that uh, sometimes it's really hard to switch gears and switch hats from, you know, design, true design thinking and using trace and a pad of paper to, you know, just responding to emails on insurance requirements or whatever, you know, is popping <laughs> up in your inbox that day that needs attention. But, um, you know, spreading out and delegating some of that more administrative work um, and, and trusting the team to figure out what they need to figure out or come to you if they really can't. It's it's not easy to actually get out of your own way to kind of be to, to be the leader of the company and to like and to let go of those design yeah. tasks and also you know particularly as a specialist that's where you feel like your expertise is and the business side of it might not be the bit that you're most confident yeah but, in. and I I think one of the things that probably helped me most to to put into perspective I mean we fill out timesheets on a daily basis right or on a weekly basis we're submitting mm. them. Um, but to really take record of, you know, I have my, my projects in mind of, you know, how many hours I'm going to spend on them for the week. And then we see kind of the week go by and, and seeing in real time what I end up spending my time on and how much of it is not the, not that it all needs to be billable as a principle. It's often not, but, uh, understanding where the, the time is going because that's a non renewable resource in it. The more that you can delegate that out initially and early on and just be brought in for, you know, high level decision making, uh, the more you can pivot and focus on, you know, why I became an architect and to impact the built environment and not necessarily, mm. um, you know, the, the administrative business end of things. How do you, how do you find, um, kind of training the next level of leadership is that conversation that's starting to happen at, at indigo where you're looking to identify other leaders and other potential partners and and if so what's the what's the process that you're starting to put those people through so we have again i mentioned we have a couple different companies and we're we're looking at launching a few more and part of part of launching new companies is really empowering the individuals to step in. And it's a, it's a type right. of profit share that we say, all right, you want to launch a new company and it's going to be min large, uh, primarily minority owned because you're a minority and that's great. And we support you in that. Um, and we kind of set up the parameters and try and keep them focused on what they want to focus on. If that means they want to learn the backside of the business and the financials, we'll coach them on that. If that means they want to focus solely on the engineering, but they just want a new mechanism to build through, we'll help them with that. And so, Part of it is kind of that empowering and doubling down on where employees want to go. And if they want to be an owner of their own company, great. If they want to partner together, even better. Um, so we we do look to elevate employees from within. Um, and if it means, you know, they want to work on their own in the future, that's a, a risk we take. But our, our philosophy is that if we're creating or setting up the right parameters and we're creating a place where people like to work and they're, um, you know, financially doing well, what reason would they want to leave? So that's really interesting. Then you're actually encouraging a culture of entrepreneurship, yeah. where 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 people are able, you know, feeling like they can take, you know, that that entrepreneurial step inside of their own, inside of your framework, basically. Yep, yeah. and and it might be it might seem as kind of opening up doors to compete against ourselves, um, but we're we're very transparent in our 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 philosophy and in that benefit of entrepreneurship at every level and within every individual i think outweighs yeah. that risk of competition i love that i mean i i i think sometimes there's too much um attraction placed on setting up a business and that it kind of it's a bit misleading about this the ideal of freedom and you know what yeah. we have what, what happens is that we have a lot of very very small businesses that are underperforming and are all struggling and actually I, I think this is a kind of enlightened leadership, if you like, when businesses start to recognize the intra or entrepreneurial lust of their employees and actually give them a space to to, to develop it in a in a safety, right? And to, and to actually leverage your expertise and experience, and and that's only going to lead to better businesses all all the way around. Yeah. And if you if you make if if part of it happens that you do um, create a competitor, well, that's a pretty good sign on your part that <laughs> you know that, that 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 you were able to do that. I mean, we look in the we look in the UK, for example, and how many businesses have been born out of your Fosters and your Rogers and the sort yeah. of the main architecture firms, um, and it's 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 a good it's a good sign of success. 
It's it's also just I think a, a mentality as well of um, whether or not someone you know leaves to form their own company or they leave to go to another company. Uh, we're, we've worked together. We've invested in this person. That relationship most of the time is is worth maintaining. Yeah. Um, and so even when someone leaves to go, say to a competitor, or say they you know circumstances change and they have to physically move and they they need a change, fine. But keeping that door open and you never know. And I've, I've experienced it many times where companies I've left, I've gotten back in touch with or employees that I've worked with and work, had work for me have left and we've gotten back in touch. And it's, if you can maintain those relationships, that's kind of one of the, the biggest um, investments that you can make in the bit in the professional world is maintaining mm-hmm. worthwhile relationships. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. So what does uh, 2023 have in store for Indigo River? A lot. <laughs> we um, in in 2020, we actually we bid a program um, kind of in the height of a lot of public projects going on hold. There was a public RFP process for an offshore wind training mentorship program that we uh, had some experience in, and one of you know uniquely qualified experience in New York Harbor in offshore wind and in renewable energy. Um, and we bid this opportunity kind of atypical of our normal service and business line offerings. And we were awarded it um, this past year in 2021. And so it's kicked off. Um, it's with New York City Economic Development Corporation. And we've we've extended our commitment to diversity and um, especially, you know, participation within the architecture, engineering and construction community within New York Harbor. Uh, and so we are mentoring and have a mentorship program set up in place for minority women disadvantaged business enterprises all to go through this offshore wind training space. And that's, um, you know, a new and emerging industry. And we look at some of the industries that have, that have been kind of standing in stone and have systemic issues with getting, you know, minority and, and different people into positions of power, just the way that the pipeline and the glass ceilings are. Um, and so here we have an entirely new industry that's kind of open to anyone to step in and embrace. And so we are looking to launch other minority and women and disadvantaged businesses into this space and beyond the mentorship program itself is standing up a training school for workforce development yeah. um, within this kind of new emerging technical field that um, New York State, or well, federally the United States, as well as on the state level, New York State, New Jersey, many other states have very ambitious renewable energy wind goals, and the workforce just is not there yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and so starting, standing up this program is something that we're uh, very excited about and looking forward to kind of fleshing out. Hey, um, you mentioned a, a quite a, a few times now that, that you're doing a lot of work in terms of empowering um and being a, being an advocate for minority leadership, um, both in you know kind of diversity and in terms of of women owned businesses, um, how has that kind of element come come out in the business, and and what sorts of programs do you do you run? So or how how does it operate at the grassroots level as well? I suppose is the other. I mean, I guess that. At the, at the smallest level, it has to do with who we hire and having a very balanced and diverse workforce. Um, and that's not indicative in, you know, much of the industry. You, it's white male dominated, um, sure. not, not news there. Um, but the, some of the cultural shifts that we've been able to kind of champion and maintain certainly I think can be attributed to have different perspectives um, in the room. And that also permeates into our work and the type of work that we do, where you might wonder, you know, how do you, what does an inclusive peer look like? And what does that mean? Well, others haven't been asking the question, so they don't know. And we are asking that question and that's kind of integral to who we are. Um, So that's um, kind of on one level. On another level, I, like I said, I I volunteer with the National Council of Architecture Registration Boards that facilitate licensure. And so understanding some of the gaps that have been kind of in the pipeline of who are licensed professionals um, and who have not been and why is it important to get those voices in the room um, and how does that affect and shape code and policy. And um, an example I always give has to do with, you know, women's public restrooms. You go to a stadium that was built in the 50s and the the percentage of baby changing tables in the women's room compared to the men, well, the men's room, it's non-existent unless it was recently installed. And Mm -hmm. that's a function of what the code was and what the standards were and what the guidelines were at the time that the building was created or designed. Um, And so now as we move forward and society has shifted and evolved and we really are being a little bit more egalitarian in our approach of, you know, what does the public deserve and who 
what comprises the public and that's you know a lot of different backgrounds and so embracing and including those backgrounds in the process is a big part of it so that we can understand and hear the voices and and respond to them amazing brilliant and that's a perfect place for us to conclude the the conversation there dana thank you so much for um opening and opening the doors and and sharing with us about what's happening in indigo river really innovative and thoughtful business structure with a very compelling uh niche set of expertise so thank you so much for coming on the show thank you for having me it's my pleasure and that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.